here today and it's my distinct uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Shuba, who was the former professor of neurosurgery, oncology, orthopedic surgery, and radiation oncology at Johns Hopkins, but now is the chairman of neurological surgery at North Shore LIJ. And today we'll be discussing cervical spine tumors, their presentation, workup, and management. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shuba. I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to John and to everyone. And this is probably my last talk with this, this uh, title page. As John alluded to, I'll be uh, in a couple of weeks, be of a different employer. Uh, I work for Northwell in the greater metropolitan area. It's going to be great. And uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak at this wonderful, wonderful forum. Just to, just to give you guys and girls all credit for this. I, I said it earlier, this is a beacon in the night in the last year when we, we missed out on a lot of national meetings to have you guys and girls be, be pioneers in this. Uh, congrats and kudos to you and thank you on behalf of the rest of us. All right, let's see. How do I advance? There we go. So um, disclosures, here's a bunch. I don't think there are any uh, specifically relevant to this, but uh, there they are. So, you know, I wanted to talk on cervical tumors uh, because it's this interesting thing to me. I think that, I think when we think about spine tumors, for some reason, I think we always think like thoracic. It's like, oh, that tumor in the thoracic. I mean, that's where the obviously majority of meta metastasis occur just because there's the most levels. Uh, low back pain, we think of the lumbar, cervical, we think of the neck and the arm pain. But these cervical tumors are different. And I think that this is worth its own little thing. And, and I'd like to share some of the insights I've learned and, and obviously make this a discussion. I won't go too long, but I wanted to at least put some base, base things in that I, that I feel strongly about. So what's, what guides us? There's about a million things that guide us, right? And, and you know, everything's a case by case basis, but you wanna have some simple things that you kind of almost in your mind check off and hopefully they become second nature. So one is spinal cord compression. This is the one I think we all get, all right? I think we get this one pretty well. If the spinal cord is smushed and the patient's weak, we act very, very quickly. This is something that we're very good at. Instability, I think uh, the surgeons in the group, I think this comes naturally to a lot of them, or maybe they can't articulate it every single time, but they have a sense of, well, I've seen that and that looks unstable and I treated one like that. I didn't treat it and it got worse. So there's almost a gestalt or, or kind of just a, a sense of knowing it, but we can be a little bit more specific than that, that gestalt. There's local tumor control. That's a goal. That goal really is um, I think in two areas, one is, is people say local infection control. That's when you talk to your ID people and they say, got to operate to get local source control. The other one is really local tumor control for the, for the radiation resistant tumors that uh, can be locally aggressive. We'll go into those. Debilitating deformity. Uh, I remember talking to a, a good friend of mine who's a tumor surgeon who will remain nameless on this, but he said there is no deformity in tumors. They're separate. This is years ago. Uh, I think he still feels this way, and I strongly feel against this because what we've ha what's happened is we've gotten better at keeping these people alive. Uh, God bless them. And uh, if we if we fuse them or don't treat them in a way that preserves or maintains their alignment in some way or prevents uh, deformity, these are going to be patients who turn from a cancer patient or a tumor patient to a patient as a deformity, uh, uh, and it's very dis very de debilitating. And then finally, this this unicorn, uh, this uh, Bigfoot called survival and satisfaction. Uh, last time I checked, no one can tell the future. Uh, and this is it. This is very hard to be able to say to someone, I'm bringing you on this journey. This is why you should come with me or not come with me because I can predict your survival or your satisfaction. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Are we getting better at this? I think so. There's a lot of people who spend a lot of time and money in Wall Street trying to predict, predict the, the market. Uh, they use a lot of models. They still can't predict the future, but they've probably gotten better. And some of those techniques are being put into spine surgery, into medicine in general. So I'm going to go through those uh, in that order and, and uh, show some cases. So spinal cord decompression, uh, don't read this. This is just to show you the Lancet article that came out in 2005 with Roy Patchell. I remember when this came out. And this pushed the field uh, from going for, you know, do we radiate METs to do we operate on them? And just to remind all the people who might not remember this, the prevailing theory for this randomized trial was that it was gonna show once and for all that radiation was better than radiation plus surgery. And why are you taking people who have stage four cancer through surgery? And they had to stop the study early because it showed the opposite. It showed that decompressive surgery and radiation resistance of tumors with stabilization when needed was better for the endpoint, which was ambulation. Now was ambulation really uh, just for paralysis? No, it's probably also for broken backs. So if you stabilize somebody, they got up and they walked. So the endpoint was stabilization, I mean, it was ambulation, and really it was for those radiation resistant tumors, not the myelomas, 
not even the, the, the you know, uh, the lymphomas, probably not even considerably the breast cancers in here. But again, this was the turning point. And we saw a sea change. We went from people being very palliative uh, to being a little bit more aggressively palliative, if you will. And really, this is a, this is a slide borrowed from Mark Bilski, um, where it basically shows the Bilski grades, uh, zero, uh, one, two, three, or, you know, this is probably the worst three you'll see, you know, very, very bad three. But the idea is this, if you look at the neurology or the compression or the, uh, uh, the Bilski grade or something like this, you combine it with radiation sensitivity, it'll give you kind of a sense on what to do uh, for compression. So for example, if you have any of these in theory, and they're all neurologically stable, and it's myeloma, in theory, you can radiate these. I mean, people will be very hesitant to radiate that number three for obvious reasons, but the idea is anyone who hasn't seen a, a myeloma case, I, I, I haven't shown in this, in this slide, but you can show pictures of where there's nasty myeloma where it looks highly compressive, they radiate emergently, and in five days as an MRI, it looks like there's no tumor there. So in theory, albeit again, using judgment, using the trend of the patient, are they getting weaker? You might not do it on three or even two, but these patients all can receive uh, radiation if it's super sensitive. On the other hand, if it's radiation resistant, which classically is the renal cells, the sarcomas and such, um, you really can't, th those tumors laugh at this conventional radiation. So you gotta put, you gotta juice it up. And whether it be focused photons or focused protons or hydrons or something other type of heavy particle, you can't have the spinal cord of the esophagus in the area. So to the zero upper left on this one, you can probably draw a line with your crayon around that, uh, that tumor. And if you can do that, you can nail it with high intensity uh, 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 radiation and treat it. Now, of course, you, if you have to stabilize, you have to stabilize, but if not, you can treat it. Number one, you probably can get close to, some radiation oncologists will do that. Some won't, won't feel comfortable unless there's some kind of separation surgery. But if you get to definitely two and three, you're, you're not able to treat it with conventional because it's not gonna do anything. And it, you can't really map it with a focused strong radiation, stronger radiation. So these are the type of patients where you might consider a separation. But this is the idea in terms of compression. Now, in terms of instability, again, both the, the gnomes or, or some of these uh, things that you saw in the last one are instability, we're all set up for historical lumbar, but I'm gonna expand it to cervical. There really is no grading scale specifically for cervical in tumor like there has been in trauma with the uh, SLICs uh, or SLICs. But let's take something from the, um, from the tumor group. So this is the spinal instability neoplastic score, the SIN score. And when we looked at this years ago, we really based it on the, the statement coming out of Punjabi, which is really instability is, the, is but from a neoplastic process, one that creates pain or deformity or, or neural compromise under normal physiologic loads. Now, physiologic loads for me at my age, you know, bending over and putting my socks on, you know, physiologic loads for you guys might actually involve some kind of sweating or lifting. So, you know, but the idea is your spine is probably stronger than mine. So physiologic loads are physiologic loads. And so the idea is that if a tumor causes an issue, uh, it's a problem. And there was this kind of modified Delphi approach. We thought of all these interesting things, six different categories, we rate it, but then we validated it. And we did some reliability studies and we found that it was good in multiple studies. But the idea is not so much the points. And this, whether you end up stable, potentially unstable or unstable, is that this is a way to start thinking about, hmm, what's important? Location matters. It, it matters in real estate and it matters in your spine and your brain for that matter. Um, if you have something at C2, C1, and it's destructive, you are going to have pain every single time you turn your head. Uh, and it's going to be debilitating. People walk into the clinic holding their head. If it's in, you know, the S3 part of the sacrum, uh, it's probably not going to be unstable, right? Because there's no ala that attaches to the, to the pelvis at that level. So you can see the points. I think the strongest one for me really is the clinical one. That's number two. Um, the other ones are all really radiographic. That was number two. Do they have mechanical pain? Uh, our radiation oncologist, I talked to them this years ago. I said, I really want to know about if it's mechanical or if it's tumor pain. Mechanical being associated with some type of change in movement. Tumor pain being pain that really bothers you in the middle of the night when your, cort when your cortisol levels go down, your natural steroids go down. And now uh, they, they learned it very quickly and they'd call me and they'd say, you got to take care of something. I said, really right now? And they say, Dan, this patient has mechanical pain. And I'd say, gosh, darn it. Why don't I teach you that? But they, they got it. And they understood that this is the way to get the surgeon's attention. If you say mechanical pain to me, you're basically saying this is a patient that needs to be stabilized, whether it's surgically with cement or what have you. And then you can look at these and you can add these up. And like I said, this has been shown to be reliable. Now, does it play out in the cervical spine? It does. It core, it, there is an issue. We do have a location, as you can see, in the cervical spine. Uh, but the cervical spine is a little bit more flex, is a lot more flexible. So we have to have probably a little bit lower threshold to consider something unstable in the neck 
where we would say in the thoracic spine where the rib cage and sternum are supportive. I'll show you a quick case. A 55-year-old with breast cancer years ago presents with severe neck pain, occipital neuralgia, otherwise no known metastatic disease intact, and she's got this. And so you can see this lytic lesion of C2, and you can see bilateral uh, pathologic pars fractures, right? So she's got neck pain, and I, I don't have an MRI for you, but you can kind of see the outline. It's not compressed in the spinal cord, and the patient's not as neurologically intact. So you look at this, and you bring out your handy-dandy SINs or something like it in your mind, and you can uh, start counting these things. You say, okay, it is junctional. Uh, oh, she does have mechanical pain. It is lytic. Maybe there's a little deformity. It's starting to, it's starting to sink. Maybe there's a little collapse. It does have bilateral pars fracture. Lo and behold, now you've got a high SIN score. If you didn't think that was unstable before, this is something that can help you uh, uh, guide you. And this is very, very helpful for people who are not surgeons who are radiologists. And they say, you know, I, I didn't go through uh, how to stabilize things and I went through that training, but I'm going to get a sense of it. And this is really helps them. So it's, it allows us to communicate. So you can do whatever you want this. I, I thought at least, you know, six, is that six or seven, seven different things. And I always say, if you have five surgeons in a room, there's about 10 opinions. So I put myself, I've had seven for myself. Now, conventional XRT alone, again, it's unstable. Please don't do that. Otherwise, the patient will still have mechanical pain. You must still might want to do XRT, but not alone. SRS, just a little stronger. I don't care which one it is. You're probably going to rate this at some level. It's a metastatic lesion. Cement, yeah, I just don't think I know anyone who can put cement and reconstruct those posterior uh, bilateral pars fractures. Laminectomy and XRT, there's no decompression needed. This is like the worst option. You do a laminectomy, you go in there, do a surgery. It's already unstable, and you just destabilized it more. This is one where the patient says thank you as they um, are you know, making a fist in front of your face. Uh, posterior fusion, laminectomy, it's an option. Anterior, uh, going transoral on a metastatic lesion. Um, I'll show you some cases. I wouldn't sign up for it if it were me. Um, and then combined, of course, you're never wrong if you say combined in a spine conference, uh, but I think there's a little bit overkill on this one. So this is the one we decided to do. And this patient had a posterior uh, a lateral fusion and had SRS of uh, that lesion. And she lived for about seven more years and then she succumbed to her systemic uh, disease of breast cancer when she had lesions in the viscera. In terms of local control, now let's think about tumors that are not uh, resistant, are not uh, sensitive to radiation and have local control issues that become very, very painful for the person involved, their family, and of course us when we're trying to take care of these challenging tumors. And, and these are things like chordomas or osteosarcomas or things that you think you can get out. And if you don't get out, you, you have to deal with a lot of uh, other issues uh, down the road. I think the biggest issue in the cervical spine is the regional, on one side, the regional bony constraints. We always say with the neck, sub up, you go front back, you can go to the front, you can go to the back and go front back. It's dealer's choice. Yes, until you get really high or until you get really low. All right, and then you have bony constraints like the jaw and the sternum. And we're gonna show some cases about how you have to mitigate those. Then you have the regional soft tissue constraints, right? That are not, uh, uh, so we know this. We know the esophagus and the trachea are ones in the middle. Uh, the trachea is hard to get into, knock on wood. It's very hard to get into. Sometimes people wonder if they got into it. If you ever are confused, if you got the trachea, you'll see giant uh, jets of, of oxygen blowing in your face. So if you don't see that, you're not in the trachea. But the esophagus, on the other hand, uh, yeah, you can have very subtle injuries to that and, and you don't pick them up till later. So this obviously is a different bird. Uh, the vertebral arteries we worry about, the carotid arteries on exposure, uh, and then the nerves. And here you have things like the hypoglossal high, the phrenic also high, the relingeal, as we know, can be both the superior and the recurrent. And then I have uh, things that you might, you see me have parentheses about what can we sacrifice and what we can. And I, I, I said things we can't sacrifice at the esophagus, trachea, vertebrals, carotids, hypoglossal, phrenic, laryngeal. Uh, we can take carotid, uh, we can take vertebrals, we can bypass carotids. Hypoglossal, you really don't want to take them. Uh, um, they, they really are a, are a bad uh, uh, impact on speech and swelling. Can you take roots? You don't want to take them either. Can you take five? Terribly uh, uh, challenging to take someone C5 away and their hand roots, like eight and one. Can you take away seven? I don't want to, but if there's a tumor that's going to save your life, uh, triceps can be something that you can live with. So parenthetically, there's almost a rating system. Please, again, don't take from this talk that you can take these nerve roots, but these are sometimes things we have to rate, rank, and see how we can do this. Let's now go through some cases. Here's an upper occipital cervical case, and, and you're going, Dan, why is it called upper? It's occipital cervical, by definition, is upper. No, for me, I start, you know, I start dividing these hairs more and more as I do more cases. Why is this upper? Because if you look at the top of this tumor, it goes all the way up to the hard palate, uh, uh, and, and on this patient's face, it goes basically up to the nasopharynx. So, so, you know, sometimes like my C2, I don't know where it is, but it might be at the base of my tongue. In this lady's, it's above her tongue and all the way in her nasopharynx. So this is something that is very challenging to get from standard approaches. Here you see the tumor. 
and you can see it's starting to distort the cord in the epidural space. Here's the CT scan with lytic, more in the, in the three than the two in this area. And this is the kind of idea that you're thinking about uh, it, with exposure if you're trying to get this out as one piece so as to avoid uh, something that keeps coming back uh, and coming in and coming back. Uh, so you can go through the nose or, or sublabial, you can go through the mouth and you go transcervical. The issue is with this, if anyone's ever done transoral approaches, it is extremely challenging to work in the narrow core of the mouth with anything that you have to deliver. Uh, it is very, very painful. You have this big, big uh, uh, meaty tongue in the way and the, and, the, and the corridors with the teeth can be very strict and sometimes patients jaws don't open. Transcervical, we all know, the only thing is the angle, you might not be able to see the clivus from that angle and, and have good ability to work and get over the tumor. So in this case, um, we decided that we might have to combine these approaches, maybe B and C together. And so here's the tumor, you can see it, it's kind of hidden by the jaw and this is foreshadowing to let you know that if I could magically remove that jaw in panel two, I would see the tumor nicely in the front. Um, nothing's magic, there's no secret, uh, but we do have to be creative here. And you can also see its relation to the blue and the red, which is the, the um, jugular and the carotids. And here you can see the tumor on all sides. This is a paper we wrote a little while back. And uh, I, I like this uh, uh, paper in theory because it kind of, if you look at it, I'm a big fan of pictures. Like I love pop-up books as a kid. So the less words, the better. So, you know, if you look at A, that's a, you know, we have this idea that there's a tumor that can come right up to the vertebral artery and you can remove it without touching the vertebral artery. If you go to B, uh, it starts to kind of wrap around it. And then what we decided, I know this is kind of artificial, but we said once you're past 180 degrees around that vert, it's really hard to get that vert out without either getting into the tumor or getting into the vertebral artery. Uh, so you're kind of saying that once you kind of pass 180 degrees or 200 or 210, whatever you're comfortable with, it's really hard to release that. And obviously C and D become an issue. So you have to sit there and make a decision. Are you sacrificing this vertebral artery that everyone's scared of sacrificing uh, in cervical tumor cases? And the answer is, I hope you looked at these images before you were in the operating room, because it would be nice to maybe talk to your angio people and maybe they can actually do a test to see if this artery can be taken or they can take it for you. And then it becomes a moot point in the operating room. I've had a number of chordoma cases where uh, I've, I've had the luxury of taking the, the vertebral artery. And I've had a couple where they say, you cannot take that vertebral artery, Dan. And those are cases where I do an on block ish. I cut the tumor in half and I break it open like a, like a cracked egg and I hopefully don't spill out the contents and you kind of take it off the vertebral artery. That's not ideal. For those, I usually do focus radiation beforehand uh, to sterilize the tumor and then take the tumor out in hopes that I've taken out mostly dead tumor. But these are things that you want to think about. And this is complicated. And we all do this. So don't get overwhelmed by this, this, uh, this roadmap. Uh, you know, this was like, you guys are all too young. All ones, but like, it was like MapQuest before phones came out. And you had to like print it out and I'm turning left in 20 miles. Okay, hit the odometer. Don't, don't, don't be like this. Just think about what you're going to do. The pathology matters, right? Is it a primary met? Met, we're going to be willing to, to, to take it out intralesionally. Um, and then we also care about the encasement. So the geometry, so the, the type of tumor, the geometry, and then of course, can you take that vertebral artery? So if you can't take it, you can't take it. And if the tumors are met, maybe you just scoop it out and you don't leave a little bit on the radiator anyway. So these are some of the things to think about, but just you get bored and you, and you wanna look at something, take a look at this paper because it's helpful. So this lady ended up having an embolization done with a robust coiling uh, of the vertebral artery there. And we did a posterior approach to release the posterior elements, put some rods in. Um, and I put a elastic sheath down so that I can find uh, my, my bookmark from where I was in the first, first time I read the book. And then when I come in the other side of the book, I can know where I was. All right. And then for these types of tumors, it's such a destructive lesion. And there's a chance down the road, usually I don't do this a priori, but there's a chance I, I'm going to radiate on this lady. I decided not to radiate beforehand. Um, and so we're going to do things that we want to heal. Uh, and so that I can, uh, uh, if this comes back, we can use protons. So this is an artist rendition. Uh, this is what this lady looked like. So uh, exactly like the artist rendition, except a little more, uh, uh, you know, hopefully you're you're not uh, eating dinner yet or wherever you are, that this is kind of gross, grosses people out. But this is the idea. And you can start seeing what we're doing. I've tagged the carotid on the left. I've tagged the hypoglossal on the left with blue. The yellow is on the carotid. Where's the uh, internal jugular? Uh, it's gone, I think. I might've taken it already. Uh, you can take the internal jugular or the, and the external and the anterior jugular, et cetera. Uh, here's, here's the uh, uh, splitting. And this is when you start um, losing a little focus, but you can see the jaws split. I have the help of an oral maxillofacial surgeon because the biggest issue is you don't want to denervate the teeth, right? So you got to be careful of the inferior of the nerve and you don't want to have, bring the teeth together crooked because you'll have malocclusion or the lip because the patient will say, why does my lip have a little edge to it? 
um, they will say that immediately and for the rest of your care for these patients. So you might want an oral maxillofacial surgeon involved. Um, and here you can see some of the things, right? So there's the crowd. You can see a little, a little, a little nub in there. That's probably the superior lingual artery. But then up here, you start seeing uh, uh, some of the uh, lingual nerve, as you can see, going to the tongue. It's such, and the hypoglossal thing is just above that. You can take the tumor out on block, and then you harvest this, uh, this big specimen, right? You, you have to harvest with a pedicle. This is our plastic surgeons who, do, who I do this with. And, uh, and they have a great old time when they do this. I think they spend about as much time on this part as we do on the face. And so by the time you're done, uh, they, they're, they're, you know, they're ready to hold their trophy up and, and lay it in. So it's great. And then you lay it in and then you bring the draw back together and you have something like this. I just saw this lady on Zoom. I should have taken a picture because she's all healed and looks pretty good. And, and you can see this is just a few months out. She's already starting to heal uh, her bone into the clivus uh, and, and she's looking very good. This is an occipital cervical case. It's a little bit lower. And you say, wait, it's a C2 chordoma shoe, but it's the same thing. No, 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 it's a little bit different. If you look where the T2 number is or the, the symbol, that tumor stops there well below that. And look where his nasopharynx is way up high. So I didn't want to split this gentleman's jaw, different approach. I thought that I probably could get this submandibular in the front. So what I thought was, let's go in the back. Let's do the same thing we did on the other lady. But let's, and I knowing that I'm probably going to lock him into the skull for anchor points to keep stability. I did not do this on stage one. I just went to C1. Now, this is the case. There's only one screw on C1. And then we go all the way down to like, I don't know, C6 or something. I don't know what that is. Or a C7 pedicle screw. That's not a, the most, most stable fracture to hold someone's head up. So the goal was to come back and, and put screws in the, in the skull at some point. But why not in the, in the first time? So that I could do this. So I could pull this gentleman's head all the way back, keep the flexibility, and maybe treat him with a subbandular approach or Lincoln Highway approach or whatever you want to call this. We kind of get under there. And this is the idea. You go in standard... Uh, you know, this looks like everyone's standard ACF approach. You're well familiar with this, um, but we just get a little bit more uh, exposure. And you can see the omohyoid right there. Uh, and that's the after the specimen's been removed. And there's the dura. Uh, there you can see the dura. The head is on the right, feet are on the left. And then you take this out in one specimen and, and put a cage in like you. So this was done actually before the last one. So I'm using a more and more allograft. And uh, uh, you can see I covered this cage because the esophagus is uh, right next to it. And I also ended up folding in some sternal mastoid because I've seen erosion of the esophagus after uh, these cages are placed. Uh, and then when I went in the back and I put in some fibula, went to the skull and there's a specimen. And this is, I just saw this gentleman, he's about, uh, I don't know, a year and a half out now and he's actually fused through there. I have a CT uh, uh, and, he, and he's very happy. God bless the guy. Now we start getting to the subaxial spine and uh, the issues become probably more of what I said before. You didn't hear me say anything about problems sacrificing bilateral C2s sacrificing bilateral C3s. Now you take three, four, and five, and you have to worry about the phrenic on both sides, right? But this, those were issues that I didn't seem to worry about. As you get lower, now you're getting into the hand function, the shoulder function. So this is a young man with a, with a, um, with a, uh, a liposarcoma, which they told me, I said, if I have to get this out in one piece, I will take his C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 roots on the left side and make him very, very functionally impaired. And they told, and I, and I presented this at our sarcoma board, which is so important to have friends who do things uh, better than you. And you call them and say, uh, am I really taking this out on block? Is there nothing else? And they said, if you do not take this out on block, his five-year survival is 5%. So I said, what if I take it out? And they said, if I take you take it out on block with negative margins, his five-year survival is 13%. So I presented this to the patient and family. They said, we'd rather go for the 13%. And I said, you might have a deficit that, that doesn't recover with nerve transfers either. And they said, let's do it. So here he is. Uh, we did the posterior approach first, and you can see all those nerve roots cut, right? Because they were they were involved in that in that lesion going right into the tumor. We didn't want to get into this tumor, uh, and it's tough when you're cutting C5, C6, 7. I left I think C8 and T1, so he had hand function. And again, here's the uh, approach, uh, removing the specimen, and their head is on the right, feet are on the left, and you can see the dura here, and here's the drain from the back, and here's the rod from the back, and here's actually the cut, the cut brachial plexus, right? Which is horrible to look at, but at the same time, getting this out is imperative. This this young man is now out. I want to say three years now uh, with, no, with no local recurrence or distant recurrence. He did end up getting proton beam about a year after this, just because the oncologist said we don't want to have uh, not treat it. Um, and he's been uh, tumor free, which is great. And here he's completely actually fused through that fibular strut that I put in that area. And so this is the kind of idea. Now, finally, as we get down to the cervical thoracic junction, you have a different issue. Now you have start dealing with the great vessels. You start dealing with the, obviously the bony sternum and you uh, uh, deal with, in theory, uh, uh, the heart if you get low enough, but you're really never gonna go that low uh, uh, because uh, once you get to, to T3, T4 from the front, it becomes very, very challenging because the heart is very hard to move. 
Uh, here's this approach for this lady with a desmoid tumor. She was actually seen a major cancer physician told that she had to have uh, an upper uh, shoulder and arm amputation in addition to this tumor at once. Uh, this was, uh, I think, a little bit aggressive. I, I think I consider myself aggressive and I, that was a little bit much for me. I said, how about we just take the tumor out on block and leave you with your arm and function? And so we did that. And uh, she's, at, I think, about six or seven years out with no recurrence. So it worked out. Here's the approach. Her head is up. Again, you can see all these little ties. You know, we took out the uh, internal jugular. We took out uh, uh, the external jugular. We actually swung the sternocleidomastoid. mass. So you can do these things and you can repair it, but you can't take those nerves and you can't take that carotid esophagus or trachea. So be mindful of those. There's the carotid over the top. Uh, now this is, uh, the head is on the right. The feet are on the left. So there's the tumor above. And this is after the sternotomy, uh, which uh, is nice to have uh, someone closing the sternotomy for you, even if you can do it on your own, uh, which, I, which I will do. I always have my cardiac guys close it. Uh, because I don't want to deal with the mediastinitis and the, and the osteomyelitis of the sternum. They know how to do it. But uh, they taught me a long time how to open it. And somehow, whenever I want to have them open it, they're not there. So uh, sometimes you just get a, a, a craniotome and you can go through that. But, but let's plan on having always a cardiac person there. You take this tumor out. And this is the kind of picture you see. The sternocleidomastoid mastoid is actually swung. Back here under the sternocleidomastoid is the accessory. You got to identify that when you're screwing around with the SCM. Otherwise, they'll have a, a drop shoulder. Uh, the, what we're attracting is the carotid. Uh, and the next to that is the ascending pharyngeal. And then next to that is a vertebral artery. And you can see the brachial plexus. All right. So those are, those are local approaches and things to think about in cervical cases. Uh, and you, as you can see, I mentioned oral maxillofacial. I mentioned cardiac. I mentioned um, you know, plastic surgery, et cetera. You got to think about these things. And of course, angio and such uh, for the vertebral artery. In terms of debilitating deformity, I'm not going to go through the slide again. This is to show you when you look at deformity classification, you got to think about things. You got to think about is it deforming the cervical or the cervical thoracic or below that? And you got to think about some modifiers like the SVA and the horizontal gaze. I'll tell you that when it comes to tumors, <clears throat> when you have destruction of the facets, just like in the s when there's a trauma to the posterior elements, it becomes extremely destabilizing. Let me also actually say something. If you have a vertebral fracture and you decide to treat that patient by taking the posterior elements and not stabilizing, you've now completely destabilized that patient, right? Because those posterior elements are so important that you go in there and say, hey, you know, I did a laminectomy, there was a, ver there was a fracture, and I took a little bit of the joint, but you can take half the joints, right? Oh dear, you know, if you got a fracture in the front and you take those joints in the back, uh, it's very destabilizing. So, so be mindful of that if you think you can go small, just put some screws in while you're there. Again, laminectomy, we know this in areas of kyphosis, it, you disrupt that posterior tension band. There's a paper we wrote years ago that in tumors, if you took more than three levels in the cervical spine and you had other factors like a big tumor, uh, uh, and they were young, where they were super flexible, they all, they all ended up with post-laminectomy kyphosis, which is a big deal because you might cure them of their tumor or treat them, and then they have a, a kyphotic deformity of their neck, and they really are really unhappy. So here's a 23-year-old. This was a lady sent to me by a neurosurgeon who's an ex excellent neurosurgeon. She had a brown Saccard syndrome, had an intramedullary spinal cord tumor in the cord, and they treated her nicely with the tumor and did a great job, and she, she, was, she did extremely well, uh, and then had a laminoplasty at the cervical thoracic junction, which is high risk, right? And then she started having her head fall forward and they kept saying, keep doing PT, keep doing PT. And every time her head slipped more forward, they said, you're not doing enough PT. So here she is with her, you can see her laminoplasty plates and you can see uh, this uh, deformity at the cervical thoracic junction. What she presented with, what she complained of was not this posture. She had longish hair and she was a young lady, but she was able to at least not talk about it. What she complained of was low back pain. I wonder why? Well. She's got actually to keep her, you know, to keep her basically C2 plumb line intact, she had to extend her lower back. So when you look at this, if you got down to the lowest part, PI, you know, for people like, like to keep the match things, you got a 52 PI and you got a lumbar lower. So she's more lordotic in her lumbar spine than you would expect her to be at that age, right? And that's probably because if you look at her, um, her neck, uh, she's, uh, she's uh, positive. Look, she's got eight centimeters of her S2 to seven plumb line, meaning that her two falls uh, more than four centimeters in front of seven. Uh, once you're at four centimeters, in general, everyone's different. People start complaining a lot. The, the disability scores start going up. You ideally want to be less than four. Uh, I'm probably at four now with my hunched posture from operating so long. But the issue is once you get above that and you fuse them or you, you know, they fall forward, disability. So this is the lady. You can see the spinal cord from the previous surgery. And look, she's starting to fuse uh, because she's leaning on that area. You know, So now you get a deformity operation. So this lady God bless her, had an intramedullary spinal cord tumor surgery that cured her and didn't leave her paralyzed. Oh my God, that's all you need, right? You did a great job, tumor surgeon. Congratulations, you're a wonderful person. Thank you. Oh, one small thing, this lady's gonna live 60 more years and now has a deform progressive deformity.
So the whole story is not just taking that tumor out, neurological deficit, it's all these things we're talking about, right? And then we correct her, we went in the front, uh, broke up that disc, put a little plug in there, and then uh, rocked her back. Uh, and I think she got a reasonable correction. And if you look at my numbers, um, you know, I measured them so they almost came exactly the same, but you know, you can measure them on your own if you're following this, but I think they're pretty darn close. Her PI and LL mismatch were almost uh, perfectly paired. Um, and this is what we did. Uh, her, her SVA now is five centimeters. It's not less than four. So, you know, uh, it is what it is, but she was quite happy and she's now, uh, doing very, very well. Now, in terms of survival satisfaction, this is the, this is the hardest nut to crack. And I have a whole other talk, which I, I won't go into for the sake of time because we're already about 30 minutes now. But this is the idea that all of us, and I think, I think the younger generations each year are better at this than the generation before them, about really saying what's important in life. Um, I think each generation does that better. They, they understand the customer better and they understand the patient better. They understand because we are all patients and customers, if you will. And so the idea is, you know, I just put this, this, this paper, I'm not going to go through the paper, but the idea that, you know, should we be operating on patients? Should I be taking that lady's leg and her face apart for that tumor. Um, if we paralyze her, maybe I shouldn't have done that. If, uh, if her cancer is controlled and we can do that, then that was the right thing. So there's this balance between about five variables. They're not linear. Uh, your experience changes as you get older, you get more aggressive or less aggressive, depending on how, how your past successes are. And you have to listen to the patient about what you think they're gonna go through. And I think we have to be better at communicating what we think is gonna happen to them. So if they say, when I hear this, and, and, I, and I apologize to all the people who say this, but I actually hate this line when people say, you know, Dan, I talk to patients, she wants it out. She wants the tumor out. And so, you know, I got to do it. She wants it out. And I go, did you tell her that it won't change her, her lifestyle and it won't change her control rate? And she might actually have major complications. They said, no, I just told her she's got a tumor and it's bad. And, you know, I said, so we got to be better at communicating. So this is the idea that we've been putting more and more papers together to look at calculators, to give patients assessments of their complication profile, their survivor profile. And their, and their satisfaction profile. And for it's, it's different in everyone. So I'll, I'll finish there, but I will conclude with kind of trying to say, hey, it's like that golf swing. You know, think about your arm and think about your leg and think about your head and think about your neck at the same time. But, but you know, we do, get a, we do get a sense of this. We get a sense of saying, this is too much. And what do we do? We use each other. We're friends. And, and again, another thing that's great about the younger generation, and this is a classic uh, uh, showing of it with this very module, this very uh, uh, medium that we're using today, is how much people want to share and, and talk to each other. And social media has made that better and better for people. But what are the things? Spinal cord progression. Again, I think we're good at this. Uh, generally, you want to take care of it sooner than later, right? As soon as possible if the patients are doing really badly. And when you got to think about what you need to do, if it's radiation resistant and high grade, you got to do surgery in most cases, right? If it's low grade, uh, I'm sorry, radiation sensitive and not compressive, maybe you consider this as an option for radiation oncology to take care of with your consultation, of course. Instability. Sometimes we get it. Sometimes we know what we're thinking. I said, that's definitely unstable. Um, if you need help, consider the sins as a guide and consider each other as a guide. Um, and consider, sometimes I'll say, consider what you think is going to happen if you don't do anything. So you sit there and say, well, that facet's taken. The patient's going to get radiation. They're not unstable today, but they might be unstable in a little while, depending on what we do. So, so always think that. Local tumor control, I showed you some, some kind of ex uh, aggressive cases. Uh, but the point of that was to kind of say, the cervical spine has its own different problems compared to the sacrum, compared to the lumbar spine, and compared to the thoracic spine, uh, depending on which way you go. And those, those issues are the local anatomic constraints. That's it. Partner with other people. Get people who've kind of hung out there in a while. Uh, uh, you know, it's always fun to hang with a surgeon who, when they see something, they don't get scared of it. And you're like, oh, really? I'm looking at the aorta, and you're with an aorta surgeon. And they're like, oh, you want me to move that thing? And they grab it with their hands and move it out of the way. And you say, oh, dear. And then they're like, but there's the spinal cord and it's got dura and I don't want to get near that. And you're like, oh, okay, uh, we're in the right place. So it's always good to partner with someone. And it's actually sometimes a lot of fun. A debilitating deformity, please don't uh, uh, too soon pat yourself on the back about decompressing and stabilizing a cancer patient if that patient is going to have a potential deformity that makes drives them crazy for years, especially if you think it's a benign tumor or a tumor that you've taken out and cured. Uh, because you, 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 those patients are going to be around for a long, long time. Uh, OC junction, you got to think about the chin brow angle. If you're fusing the, the head to the, to, the, um, to the neck or to the thoracic, I really don't like OC fusions. I really try to avoid them. Uh, if I can stop at C1 or C2, I do it uh, because of that OC junction debility uh, that you fuse them. And if it's not perfect, they're unhappy. Lordosis in the subaxial and the CT junction, which allows you to have a translational deformity. And then finally, survival satisfaction. Again, I do not know the future, uh, no one does, but we can be better than we've been. We don't just flip a coin, 
uh, and say, you know, patients in the mood for it today, maybe not tomorrow. We say, listen, let's use all our tools, predictive scores, calculators, patient goals, and each other uh, to, to bounce these ideas off of. So with that said, I'll give a shameless, shameless plug uh, to the, a book uh, that came out that is a sleeping aid if you are tired. And I, I'm sorry, you can't fall asleep at night. Just, you know, read the, read the chapter by me or the forward and it'll, you'll thank me in the morning when you had a good night's rest. Um, I want to thank everyone paying attention tonight. And uh, again, congratulations to all the leaders of this and who, who've, who've made this happen. And congratulations to all the people who come to this because this is how you, in this crazy time, continue to be, to, you know, to, 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 to make yourself be learning and be better than you can be, the best person that you can be is by doing things like this uh, when the rest of the world is, is saying, um, you know, let's just go into lockdown. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you again for having me. And I look forward to, to more success from this group. Thank you. Awesome, that was, that was absolutely amazing, Dr. Shuba. Thank you so much for that. Um, I will open this up to any uh, questions from the audience and go ahead and type it in the chat box or any uh, questions or comments from our faculty. Should well, I stop sharing, uh, John, or no? Uh, yeah, you can stop, you can stop sharing, yeah. Okay. Hey, Dr. Shuba, Shuba this is uh, Mike Galgano from Upstate University in Syracuse. It's a fantastic talk. I was wondering if you could just touch upon the learning curve for doing these cases. Uh, obviously, these are not your traditional spine surgical cases that you would learn in even very complex spine fellowships. Can you just kind of touch on um, kind of your, your journey to, um, you know, becoming a master of some of these, these spinal tumor operations in the high cervical spine? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the word master. Can you, I'm going to get my wife and I'm going to bring her in here uh, to tell her that someone thinks I'm, no, I'm kidding. But thank you for the nice, kind words. The, um, yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, you're only as good as your last at bat. So we all have to be humble with these things. I'll tell you, you know, I was thinking about as you were kind of formulating that question about the process, because now I'm at a different stage. I might've said something years ago, is that when I was younger, I just wanted to learn everything in the operating room. I just wanted to do open uh, uh, with neurosurgeons, open with ortho, uh, uh, minimally invasive. I wanted to do things in the microscope. I want to do things with osteotomes. And if I didn't learn it, I like would tell my wife, uh, uh, I need to do a fellowship. I need to hang out with this person for a month. And she's like, can you actually get a job? You know, like you're, you know, you're a man child, like you got to get a job. And, and that was something. So I, I still think that's great. I still think it's, if you like to be in the operating room, check things out as you get better. Uh, as we all know, you don't have to put in every screw, you know, you have to have to sit there and watch them, put the screw in and go, Oh, look how they use their other hand. And they kind of stabilize it. Hmm. That's kind of cool. Um, reps is important early on, as you get older, you can kind of be a little bit more thoughtful. And I think what happens is, you know, for anyone who's my age or older, I'll tell you that there's always a price of everything we just make decisions on. So I will tell you that I think I'm not, I, I am not the lateral surgeon, MIS lateral surgeon. I was, you know, 10 years ago when I first learned the lateral approach and could make the incision. I mean, I still feel great about handling vessels in the, in the belly and such, but I'm not as fast as say a minimally invasive guy. And I think because I've done so many of these operations, I've started becoming less good at being an MIS degen surgeon and that's okay. So I think what I would argue is that at least my experience was that expose yourself to everything, taste it all, especially if, you know, if that's the type of person you are, where you get to taste everything on the menu. And then as you get better in something, and as you like something, dive deeper into that area, if you want, if you want, if you like being a generalist, uh, that's fantastic. Then you have to keep, you know, keep your tabs on everything. So for neurosurgeons, a lot of surgeons would like to do brain and spine, um, uh, for me, I became spine, then I became oncologic, then I became big oncologic. So that's not for everyone. But, but as you, what I'm, I think my point in telling you this is to get really specific with these hard ones, you do have to spend more time doing these. Um, and, and if you want to be a generalist, you have to spend more time doing everything. And so I think the way that I got this way is I spent a lot of time with oncolo oncologists, access surgeons, and uh, colleagues who did these. And then I spent a lot of time early on in the cadaver lab. And I, and I always learned from my partners. So um, that was a long answer. I don't know if I answered the question, but it really depends on who you are. But if you want to go deep, you got to go deep. And if you want to stay broad, you got to stay broad. Maybe that's the answer. Thank you. Well, yeah, I thank you, when... Dan. It was a fantastic talk. Um, I have a question. How many cases do you need per year in a center uh, to, to have a, a good experience? In, in Europe, they have a tendency pooling them into some centers. In Switzerland, we have got eight, nine million people living here. I think we need two centers. Um, what do you think? What is the minimum number of cases? 
Yeah, it's probably no exact number, right? And each taste, I think for those, for those tough on blocks is individual. And so you can, you know, when you're doing a case, I always, I think I show these, these, these great pictures and what, what it belies or what it, it kind of is false advertising. Cause you know, anyone who's been with me in the operating room is like, I was excited about operating with Shuba until we were here 10 hours and, you know, dissecting the vert for three of them or something. And it's like, oh my God, uh, I thought I was, I wanted to be a spine oncologist and I just changed my mind after one case with Shuba. So I think you learn a lot in each case. And so I can't put a number on it. I will tell you that it is interesting. You know, when, I, when I've been to China, uh, they're very centralized to your point. And uh, there's, a, there's a famous surgeon out there who only really does C1, C2 fusions. And he does like 300 a year. So, you know, his expertise in C1, C2, I mean, he probably has an encyclopedic knowledge of that. Do you have to do that many to be that? You know, that's, you know, it's rare. And, and, and I remember having a discussion with the surgeons out there and I, I don't think they appreciate the, the joke, although the people who spoke English did, and I'm along with me, but I said, they said something like, they introduced me to this panel of all these surgeons who'd done spine tumors, and they were the number one, number two, and number three spine surgeons in China. That was how they were introduced to me. And they said, this is number one, he's done you know, 800 cases a year of tumors. This is number two, he does 632, and his number three does 582. This is one, two, and three, standing in order. And they said, Dr. Shuba, who's number one in America? And I said, in America, everybody's number one. And so the issue is that we have this kind of interesting thing where we give these talks and we want everyone to learn it. It's this tension between how many do you need? Because I want to do this in my hospital uh, and there's thousands of them across the country. And there's other, other thing like maybe they should be sent. And we all have an ego and we all want to try it. And it takes a little bit of, you know, when, when some of my fellows will call me uh, and they always call me a lot in the beginning. And I th that at some point they just say, oh, I'm not going to call Shiba because I think I do it better than him now. But the issue is in the beginning, they all call me and they say, should I do it this way? And the response I usually say is, do you feel comfortable doing it that way? And they say, no. I say, well, then you shouldn't do it that way. And they say, I have a great access surgeon who can get me here from this angle. And he says, or she says, and get me. I go, then work with that access surgeon and try it from that angle. So no good answer, but obviously work with what you've got. If the patient can't uh, 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 move across the country uh, for certain specialists, then don't, but, but offer that. That one with the one where I split the jaw was sent to me by a very, very well-known spinal oncologist and said, you just go out to Baltimore. And uh, I remember taking that as a, a compliment. And then I was like, or am I an idiot? Like, should I not even be approaching this case? So I think you have to use your own judge of, of uh, decision-making because there may be, I actually think the glory that comes with helping these patients is minuscule compared to the complications that I often create. So, you know, as younger surgeons kind of look at this and go, I, I love to take that out. I go, um, you know, I think I've seen every single bodily fluid in one of my drains, you know, whether it be urea, I mean, your urine, bile, pleural fluid, you know, blood, venous, arterial. I mean, so, you know, because these are high risk. So if that is also something that you want, want to do, you got to find yourself going, I'm not the kind of guy that likes having a patient be in the hospital for two weeks. This is another thing about yourself and how you counsel patients. If you don't think you're uh, uh, skilled, uh, skilled, uh, skilled yet enough, uh, you need to get those skills, then spend some time with other with friends. Come and, and do these surgeries. I remember uh, a friend of mine came and watched me and I have these crazy OCD steps on the wall. And uh, ever since then, he said, you know, I, the on block was kind of demystified when you broke it into 15 steps. I can do a laminectomy without getting a tumor. I can do a discectomy without getting the tumor. I can dissect the vessels or someone can dissect the vessels off without getting the tumor. Um, I can stabilize. I can rotate this thing out, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, wait, it, it, it's not so much art. It's a little more science. So again, visiting people and maybe with some of the video things we're doing now, I mean, with the Northwell job I'm taking, we're, we're going to be having uh, video screens in all our rooms so that we can, uh, when, when legally allowed and patients, we can share that type of data safely. Uh, we can basically broadcast these cases. So you don't have to leave, you know, you can do it from Switzerland and, and take notes and um, it doesn't have to be like it always was. We had to get on a plane. That was a long answer again, but I think you got the idea. All right. I will, I will attest to the fact that uh, operating with Dr. Shuba is like, is like this, uh, both uh, information wise, surgical technique. I mean, really drinking from a fire hydrant for, you know, trying to remember everything, trying to hang on to every word. Uh, you're, you're such a master at uh, both the concept and the doing, which is, it's really impressive whenever you put it all together. So thanks for doing this again. I feel like I need to do another fellowship with you now. Um, oh my God. Thank you for, thank you for sparing the audience from all the, you know, just, you know, you're going to want to punch him about, you know, every three hours, but you know, be sterile when you punch him in the face, change gloves. After <laughs> that's the right. That's right. <laughs>
The uh, I'm so glad you mentioned the the deformity piece because I've already had my own where I take a tumor out and and I didn't get it right and I have to go back and fix the the, the resultant deformity. Um, and obviously, being here, we talk a lot about deformity at WashU and. Um, and luckily I have great partners who can help me fix that and figure out the right thing to do. And I trained with you, so I recognize it. Um, I think most people are getting better at at least recognizing that, I hope, or it seems like it, right? Good, good, good spine surgery is understanding deformity, I think, e even if it's degen or tumor or whatever. How, where do you think we are on, the, on the, the last point you made about satisfaction? I mean, you were, you were such a master in the clinic of of coaching these patients and getting them ready. And, you know, I, I've borrowed a thousand things from the things you say to your patients that I, that I say to mine now, but how do you think we're doing as a whole? Do you, I mean, are, are, do you think we are, uh, we've been way too aggressive and, and we should move away from that? Or do you think we're, we're, where do you think we are on that? Yeah, no, Matt, I mean, you really, you really frame the question in a, in a, in a great way. And of course, in a rhetorical way, I mean, I don't think I have the answer, but I'll, I'll give you some, some highlights of where we're going. I, I, I give a different talk on, on satisfaction after tumor surgery. And it, it's all the way from, you know, you, you make someone talk differently by, you know, going through their mouth or something, or you make them walk differently by taking a nerve in their lumbar spine and you say, are they happy? And the answer is it depends, right? It depends. And, and um, I'll give you a couple of variables that no one has figured out the great model, right? You know, I always say, I say, I don't want the numbers. I want the model. I always say this, if you like, oh, I don't want, you know, how long am I going to live, Dan? Uh, it's, I want the model that determines it because I can plug and chug. Like I can then say, well, what about Dan Schub at, at 45 versus 55 versus 65? And I think the model is going to have these components. It's going to have some assessment of survival based on our best estimates. I mean, I know that's dismal, but you want to be able to sit there and say, if I have an investment that's going to bear fruit in a year, but I'm going to pass away in two months, hmm, I'm never going to appreciate that investment. So the surgery keeps me in the hospital for a month. And maybe in a year, if I fuse or heal, but my, my disease, that's got to be in there. Number two is I think a lot of, a lot of satisfaction parameters have to come from the patient, him or herself. What do I mean by that? I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. There's something called frame shift of expectations. Frame shift is this. We've all seen this, right? We have the person who was a runner, and then they got, became an older person. And then in their old age, they got lumbar stenosis. And they say to you, I used to run, I used to marathon, and they're coming in the shopping cart, right? And you say, what, do, what can I do for you? They go, I just want to walk my daughter down the aisle. I mean, I used to run. I used to play golf, but I just want to walk her down the aisle. And then you, you do a laminectomy and the patient walks the daughter down the aisle and says, Dr. Shuba, thank you so much. You don't know what this means to me. And about a year later, what does the patient say? I want to play golf again. And I feel like my back is stiff and I'm really unhappy. And I used to play golf every week and I used to be able to run. You go, Oh my goodness, they just, their expectations just shifted. And we all do this, right? You know, uh, you, know you, 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 um, you get some, you get a $50 check in the mail and you go, that's awesome. I didn't expect that. And then the next week you go, why was it a hundred dollars? I mean, we have this frame shift. So that's a, 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 the, the chasing of clouds we're never going to get. But I think there are some things that patients really do know what they want. They do want to avoid major complications. And a lot of them will be willing to tolerate minor complications. What's a minor complication? UTI, a DVT that doesn't lead to a PE and you know what have you, um, a wound infection that maybe doesn't require a second operation or one that does, but maybe it's minor. Um, what do they not like? Strokes, heart attacks, and paralysis. And so you know if you can if you can avoid those. And so for me, the big ones are. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, can, is the paralysis minor? In other words, do you have a little bit of a limp um, instead of, but you can walk? And so I think it's going to have a, like I said, it's going to have parameters that involve survival, some simple things that we probably all agree on, like the ones I named, and then a calculator that says, oh, you know, you know, uh, Matt Goodwin is, I don't know, what are you, 6'3 or something? And uh, fit and got a muscle envelope of this type and Shuba, you know, standing five foot eight above sea level with uh, osteoporosis, you know, maybe he, he doesn't need the same type of reconstruction that you do. So we have to dial in your specifics. Uh, God forbid either of us needed surgery like this, but um, I think we're going to get better. The only question I have is as we get better, are we going to realize we got better because of the frame shift? So when patients say, I really hate that restaurant because uh, you know, everything wasn't perfect and they get one out of four stars. Uh, you know, we can have patients who we keep moving the end zone and we say years ago, you were screwed. Nowadays, we can get you through the surgery. Patient says, my scar is really ugly. 
then the scar goes away. Well, now the surgery, I, I said, stay overnight. I mean, eventually the end zone keeps moving, but that's our, that's our job. It's going to be fun to do it together, you know, as a group. Dr. Shua, um, just out of curiosity, um, how do you, when you're, when you're speaking to these patients uh, preoperatively, how do you, because um, I, I, I sometimes, I, I struggle sometimes trying to explain a, uh, say a, a T-lift procedure to the patients. How, how do you, how do you explain to them um, what the, the steps are going to be and what, what's going to happen intraoperatively, um, especially with patients who, um, you know, sometimes uh, try to communicate these things or, or their, their baseline medical knowledge can be um, not, not, Great. So sometimes it can be very difficult to uh, explain these things. I'm just wondering how, what are the, some of the, the pearls that you use, some of the things that you say to them? Yeah, it's another great question because um, it's different on every patient. Uh, but I think a, a large part of it, and I think I've, I don't, I think I was actually terrible at this for years, and I think I've slowly gotten better. And um, now what I do, which is actually something I really enjoy, um, and you guys probably all do this, but it took me a long time to learn this. Um, I really enjoy it because it makes me connect with people. I actually consciously spend now a few minutes in every uh, encounter just trying to ask them about nothing about their spine. Because I'm like, hey, I used to say, you know, how can I help you? You got it. And the answer always was, how can I help you fix my damn back? You know, you know, okay, that was a killer, you know. And then, you know, it kind of killed the conversation. Or like, what can I, you know, what do you need? Well, I need you to follow, solve my problem. And so now I just sit there and say, you know, where are you coming from? And tell me a little about yourself. What did you do in your life? And what do you do as a, do you have children? And then I actually know them and, and it, it, it changes it. It also, uh, I'm getting to, getting to the point, what, to your question, is it also kind of shows me the archetype of the patient. I'm not going to group them into a certain group, but there's different types of patients. I'll give you an example. A computer scientist or an engineer, everything else being equal, wants to know the, the, the pitch of the screws that go in. Because they are, you know, this is just me and my experience. I sometimes just say, now tell me the alloy. Is this a titanium alloy or is this pure titanium? Or is this, and I'm going, oh my God. And then I say, are you an engineer? And they go, yeah. And that is what they like. And then there's other people who just say, is my sister going to be able to visit me? Or is my daughter going to be able to visit me? And those people are obviously, uh, you know, if you look at your, your kind of Myers-Briggs score, the former might be a very analytic person and the latter might be, a, a, you know, a very uh, a feeling person. Um, now that I think about it, I have an idea for a study and you guys can do it if you beat me to it. Meyer Briggs inventory on all patients, and then you actually treat them according to their Meyer Briggs. That would be actually very cool. Anyway, so um, that's probably my MBA talking more than my MD. But the thing is, the idea is that when I see the person who just is scared, I end up not talking about the T lift at all. I say, we're going to try to decompress and stabilize your spine. And they say, what do you mean? I go, it's tight. We're going to open it up and it's loose. We're going to stabilize. And they're like, and my sister's going to be there and there's going to be food that I like. And I'm like, yeah, oh yeah. And then with the engineer, I'm sitting there going, what do you want to know? I can talk for hours, as you can tell from this talk, on the, the, this thread pitch and the way I do cross connectors and the way I try to dissect. You want to know that? Be my guest. So I think it starts with understanding the person. Uh, you guys are all human beings. You do that different ways. I actually am really excited now about this. I'm going to make them take a Meyer Briggs questionnaire before they meet me. And if they're a feeling person, I'm going to be all about them. I mean, this is, I'm not joking. This is good. Matt's laughing there, but I think this is, we're on to something because at the end of it, as we all know, and for anyone who had to take these, these inventories, when someone's an introvert, they might not ask the question in the, in the appointment. Then you get the, they call up at your office two days later and go, I, I don't understand anything. And you go, you didn't ask me any questions when I asked. And they go, well, I didn't have them because they were an introvert. Meanwhile, the outspoken person, the extrovert may have babbled the whole time and didn't uh, ask anything because they want to tell you about everything in their life. So, uh, and I don't mean that I'm an extrovert, so I'm not knocking extroverts. But the issue is that um, let's let you have to learn the patient, use your own style and maybe tailor it now, what can we also do? Lots of technology, looking at movies, looking at diagrams. Uh, there's a number of tools that where people can now uh, have these playback options where they kind of hear the recording. Uh, we can pipe people in with video. Um, that being said, some people are always going to say I have more questions and some people are going to say, I got it. You don't have to talk to me anymore. So use technology as a tool. Uh, but the first thing to know what right tool to use, a pliers versus a screwdriver is a hammer is probably understanding where the patient's coming from. Take that five minutes. Uh, it's actually been such a boon for me because I really like the patients more than being like, oh, this is a spondy. I like, I'm like, this person was in like this, 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 you know, this special, you know, uh, military team and they did this operation where they parachute. And I just, I love it. I mean, I love learning about people or, or about their families. So do that. And then as you start talking to them, it's going to come more naturally. You say, I don't think you're going to like this. 
because you're going to be in the hospital for a week and, and, you know, it's COVID and you're not going to see your family. Why don't we do the small one first? Yeah, you do. You get the point. I agree. That's, that's going to be a very interesting study. <laughs> we, should, we should consider looking at that. I think, um, I think I know the authors and they're, and you know, I have them. They're all on this list right here. Uh, I'm right. going to bounce them off all you, all you folks here, whoever's interested. You gotta, but I'm you got to be ready you. to move because it's going to be done within the month. <laughs> <laughs> you'll get the report all you know everyone who's everyone who you know i i great idea shuba author author you know that's the reward for for uh telling me i had a great idea that's all you need you know flattery is the best <laughs> the best gets you everything in life that's a great idea dan first author anyway well you know i you know uh, uh and i think this is a you know even though you guys have, have uh humbled me by asking me these questions um, I think these are the ideas we have to keep doing this. And again, this is an idea that, that you guys started. Um, you know, I don't know if it was uh, Matt Goodwin or, or, you know, it could have been any one of the, the guys who've, who've, or girls who've worked with me in the past. But I remember sitting at a meeting uh, and I was a friend of ours, a colleague said, said, hey, Shuba, can you get a drink with us? I said, I'm almost done. I'm, uh, there's some the mentoring going on here or some advice or something like that. And they said, oh, you're talking to your fellow. I go, no, I'm asking for advice about something in my life. So the issue is that we all are learning at different, uh, in, from different views of the, uh, of this, uh, of the Tesseract. You know, it's not a, it's not a square. It's not a cube. It's a four dimensional shape. It's a Tesseract. And we're all like, you know, emotion and anatomy and cancer and, oh, no one's got it. So we have to keep it, uh, 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 making this model robust. The only way we do that is having platforms like this. So, you know, I'm a, the biggest fan of you guys for doing this. Uh, I can't thank you enough for, you know, including me. Uh, and uh, of course, if there's any other remaining questions, but I just want to make sure I got the plug back in uh, that you guys are and girls are doing a, a fantastic job. And whoever's watching, you are smarter, uh, not because of I'm speaking, but because of your of the type of person you're doing, always looking to get better and going to things like this. Thank you so much, Dr. Shuba. You, you may be the only person I ever heard use the word Tesseract in uh, ca uh, casual <laughs> conversations. That's... <laughs> Uh, I am a Marvel fan, so maybe I borrowed a comic book movie. But for anyone who knows shapes, that's like the four-dimensional version of a cube, like a cube cubed or something. You can't imagine it, right? You can't even imagine it. Uh, and that's, I think, how we're looking at these models. How do we imagine the perfect, the maximization curve? You know, I don't know if you guys noticed, but when you start doing high, a lot of people who know math know maximization curves. But as you get into multiple variables, it goes from a, a line to a plane to a hyperplane. And, and I don't know what a hyperplane looks like, but the idea is that it's more than three dimensions. And, and that's how you do these maximization curves. We have to do them for each of us as we, as we really kind of go through this for these patients. Sounds great. I think, um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Are, are there any more questions from the faculty? I just want to thank Dan for a fantastic talk. Pretty inspirational, you know what I mean? I mean, this is like, like the, the point of this is not only to learn but also to get inspired you know what i mean by the passion and by uh, the wisdom so thanks dan for this uh, fantastic uh, talk and i hope to see you soon I, I would love to see you soon and uh um you know maybe i'll just come by your house with an n95 and uh, we'll just hang out in the front yard you know? no need for an n95 as long as you're vaccinated so <laughs> perfect so <bye. laughs> well thank you thank you to everyone and uh have a great week and uh keep going guys uh, keep carrying the torch uh we're following you we're following your lead great leadership and take care of everyone thank you All so much everybody have a great night thank you dr shuba good night